in, I can't let people know how much it will cost or more conservative economically, conservatives will say, hey, we can't spend on college aid because we need to win the war. And so he thought he has to keep it secret. Now, there's two big things about this. First off, you see the contradiction. The great society is going, there's going to be a lot of loss tax, but his plan was to improve it in years go by, that would never happen. Vietnam would kill much of the great society, or weaken it, that it would never have the impact that he had hoped. And also, do you notice something that's not on there? It's also not on the reasons I gave you for Kennedy committing advisors. What's not on here? South Vietnam. It was never about South Vietnam. There might be talk, we're here to defend you. But that's not the reason we went to war. It wasn't because, oh, I'm worried about the South Vietnamese people. That was never the reason. And so, it's going to take a while. These numbers will show up, so we misled the public guard to have that down. You know, the numbers go up. We can't just immediately send troops. First off, we didn't have enough. So we got to train more, get more soldiers, build the infrastructure, build bases, etc. And so Johnson never told the people that, yeah, we're going to start fighting and dying in 65, but it won't be to the end of 67 before we have enough troops to where my general said we might have a chance to win. When he never told. So he lied. And this is going to go on. And where did he get the men from? When the war drafting's coming at first, over half were volunteers. But as the war went on, you could imagine as casualties went up and began to question why we're here, they're going to have to draft more and more young men. And they never called out the reserves, they never called out the National Guard. The thinking was, let's minimize the effect of people at home. Well, that made the war, well, it made it really focused in on 18, 19, 20-year-old men. As the war went on, they're the ones being drafted. By the way, then, what a great way to get out of the war. Huh? Well, some did, but, the, but join the National Guard. Join the Air National Guard. You're not going to go. So, didn't call him out because he wanted to minimize the effects at home. They called out again. Hmm? Or was the National Guard called out again? Yes. And they were called out in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some of you might know personally. And so, with that, it seemed to work though. All this escalation that summer, three of the most important great society laws passed. So gave the illusion of success. It won't last. Medicare passed. Medicaid passed. The Voting Rights Act passed. All passed that summer. To Johnson, it worked. I can fight this war and get my bills passed. But once he committed, he couldn't go back. And he would become less and less flexible on it. And soon begin to look at, at, at people opposed to him as almost traitors. They would begin to leave the uh, White House because he was just so entrenched. That's Sonny Medicare, and he's going to give the bin to Harry Truman, who won health care, health insurance for everybody. At least to Truman's point of view, is health care for the elderly, and that's what he wants. So it seemed to be working. At the same time, this was a for civil rights, an incredibly liberal time. Liberal by definition, wanting more equal rights and opportunities for all people. And the Warren Court, remember we mentioned them for the Brown decision? We're talking here about the 14th Amendment. Basically saying the 14th Amendment must say, or it says that the laws of the Bill of Rights apply to the states. That's why the 14th Amendment is the most important amendment. And so you can always tell someone's political point of view when it comes to rights. More conservative people do not like the 14th Amendment. More liberal people like it. But there's a Warren Court. A couple of the cases. Engel versus Vital said, yeah. That's the one that guarantees civil rights. And the Bill of Rights applies to the states. Also says what a citizen is. It's one of the three really important laws right after the Civil War. 13, 14, 15. And those are 14th, though. Biggie. 
And Engel versus Vital said no more mandatory school prayer. No more mandatory school prayer. So by 1960, virtually every school had intercom, especially the bigger high schools, and we would all have to pray together the same prayer. And he said, no longer can this be a mandatory prayer. And there would be a lot of backlash against this. And one thing when John Kennedy said about this was that you can still pray. You could be praying right now for this period. You could be praying for the AP exam. You just can't. I just can't make you pray the way I want because we would all be doing the Druid ritual right now. <laughs> We'd be worshiping trees. I'm not saying human sacrifice, but are there any druids in here? Just not as many druids as there used to be. Hmm? It was a it was a religion of the, the Celts in England and in Ireland. And I and I was told people were druid. Next, Baker versus Carr ended or said that the Justice Department has a vested interest to look into gerrymandering. Gerrymandering it was to write legislative districts to help one group of people or help get one person elected. You kind of tinker with the borders of a legislative district to divide up a group or put them all into one area. And this is now a really big issue. There have been a couple of huge gerrymandering cases that just went to the Supreme Court in North Carolina and Pennsylvania. The Republican majority is there gerrymandered their district to make sure that uh, Democrats would lose. And so it worked really well there for, for Republicans. But the Supreme Court ruled that they did it in such a way that was violating this. They just ruled. It's a really big deal. Another case is coming up from Michigan, another one for well, Wisconsin, another one for Texas, another one for Alabama. Also, Gideon versus Wainwright. Gideon versus Wainwright. Gideon versus Rain, Wainwright said that the Fifth Amendment does apply, meaning that people arrested for criminal cases have a right to a lawyer. Before, if you couldn't afford one, you didn't get one. They they said the Fifth Amendment said you have the right to attorney, just basically said, hey, you can get a return if you can afford one. Now it says, if you can't afford one, there'll be one appointed. But every state has different rules. And if you know anything about public defenders in, let's say, Helena, they are woefully underpaid and it's underfunded. And then places like Texas, it basically is non-existent. But in some states, it's it's uh, it's a little bit more complete, like New York. So with that, also the Miranda decision. And Miranda said that everybody arrested in a criminal case has to be told their rights. And eventually, by the late 1960s, start to, police officers started carrying around a card that had said the rights. Eventually, this became pretty uniform. And if you've watched any television show with police officers, they've all said, and they call it the Miranda. They don't have to say that, but it's, it's a catch-all. Because it was really common to arrest people and not tell them their rights and just hold them. It's, that's what happened to Miranda. And then lastly, one of the most important cases that virtually nobody knows, the Griswold decision. The Griswold versus Connecticut. The issue was, actually the issue was about states denying couples birth control and the idea of family planning. And what they ruled was is that it's implied under especially the Fourth Amendment that every single person has the right to privacy. Privacy within their home, privacy within their bedroom, privacy of their person and in their person. They have this right to privacy. This is one of the most important rulings in history because nowhere in the Constitution does it say you have the right to privacy. But the Griswold decision said it's implied especially in the Fourth Amendment. That's one of our illegal searches and seizures. A really important case. And so virtually any other case that deals with people having certain privacy rights deal with the Griswold case. 
and this concept of birth control. And we'll get to birth control because birth control is the number one single most important issue when it comes to uh, women's rights, by far. Nothing else is even close. <clears throat> that's another start for down the road. That's uh, Earl Warren. That's Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court by by LBJ, and the reason I'm pointing him out was he's the one who argued the Brown decision back in 54. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I missed what gerrymandering was. To draw legislative, legislative districts to help one group of people over another. Okay. So I said it really no gerrymandering. Well, it, it said that gerrymandering could be hard to prove, but it, it gives the courts and the justice, justice Department the right to look into gerrymandering. But it's still kind of hard to prove. Why would they have not been able to look into it in the first place? It wasn't clear. And states said it's it's a state prerogative. So states would just do it. Right. And what they ruled is no under the 14th Amendment. States can't can't just do their own legislative districts if it gerrymanders. That violates people's rights. Because what happened, like in what just happened in North Carolina, what they would do is, is they would write the district because it's still pretty segregated that all all African Americans are in one district. So, voting so and since they vote majority Democratic, that puts one Democrat district, but then make sure the other districts are going to be more Republican. That's what they did in Pennsylvania, North Carolina. That's an example. So, oh, so this one, the whole thing about school prayer, there's a fear that that's what's obviously communism, and so that's where you get the United Soviet States of America. This was an anti-communist co uh, co uh, um, comic book. I wish I had it. And see this sign right here? There's this guy outside of Miles City had this sign well into the 1980s, even though Warren had been dead for 15 years. <laughs> he had that and he get get us out of the UN. I'll never forget that. He was the guy he just didn't want to talk to. This guy who was yelled a lot and had a lot of dogs. So with that, so LBJ is actually kind of riding a wave of popularity. But going 65 into 66, that Vietnam War is becoming a real well, a scar. General Westmoreland was the commander of American forces and therefore the entire operation against the Viet Cong. How do you fight a guerrilla army? It's really hard, isn't it? Guerrilla armies will blend into society. They might get help from people. And then the villagers could say, I know nothing about it. They could be the villagers. Big units, they just hide into the jungles and the mountains, which is so rough there. And also, the North Vietnamese began to help even more. With the Unite, let me get this real quick. When the United States escalated and started sending troops, North Vietnam started sending regular North Vietnamese troops. So they started to come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to fight there too. Yeah. North Vietnam, yeah. So they started to escalate too. So the U.S. started sending troops. And here's the other thing. Westmoreland knew the United States is never going to have enough troops to beat a guerrilla army that is motivated, and they are motivated for one Vietnam, and have sanctuary. North Vietnam is supplying them. They could run away to neutral Laos and Cambodia. It's the it's mountainous jungle. We don't know where the border even is. And so the point is, how do you defeat them? Doctrine was in the United States military, which is pretty much widely accepted, you need 10 to 15 troops for every one guerrilla you fight. We're never going to have that. Ever. That means you've got to defend everywhere. And remember, guerrillas will attack weak spots, ideally. Well, if you don't have many troops, that means a lot of weak spots, right? And another thing about guerrilla armies, when if you don't have enough troops, so, like, the United States would go through an area, take, sweep through a village. They used to call it sweep and clear, then spear and net, and then another name. They would sweep through. As soon as they left, what happened behind them? And the exact same, ha same thing happened in 1780 and 81, the southern strategy that defeated the, bri or that defeated the bridge. The same exact kind of thing is going to happen. So, Westmoreland has to come up with a strategy and he came up with search and destroy. And search and destroy, now it's gonna have really bad connotations. In Iraq, they started saying this in 2004, and quickly all the public relations people in the Pentagon said, shut up, don't call it search and destroy because then everybody think about Vietnam and we lost. So, 
Search and destroy means they're hoping, at first they tried big units, but that was too easy to hide from. Then eventually small units, like that group of American GIs there, loaded down with um, you know, as many grenades as they could carry, and they would go through the jungle, small units, relatively small units, hoping what's going to happen to them. Yeah, they get ambushed. They want to run into an ambush, which you can imagine is so hard on morale. And then, okay, they're, they're shooting over there, they use superior American firepower to blow that area away. They use napalm bombs, and they would set up artillery fire bases everywhere and just blow it away. The problem with that is, how do you know you won then? And then we would go through and they literally called it body count. Get your body count, get your body count. And they would count the number of people they killed. So they would go through, okay, go one, two, three, four. How do you know someone is a dead? How do you know someone is a body? How do you know it wasn't destroyed by explosion or napalm? What do you see just two kind of ruts in the ground? That means they drug a body away. That's the feat. Is that a dead person? You count them? What if you just see a spot of blood? Is that one person? What if you want to become promoted? And what's going to happen with the body counts? There'll be, okay, we got three. Three will turn into 15. 15 will turn into 30. And by the time I would get back to Saigon, it would be 150. There's a famous story of Lyndon Johnson in 67. Being told how many Viet Cong we had killed that month of this November. Just killed so many. One of his aides whispered in his ear, We have killed more Viet Cong this month than there are BC. Than there are Viet Cong. <laughs> Johnson didn't want to hear that. He wanted to hear we're winning. So actually, all that's George Reedy was his name, and he resigned soon afterwards. That's a tunnel rat. The Viet Cong and then North Vietnamese way would build actually turn to be thousands of miles of underground tunnels for their supplies to avoid American air power, and they would try to collapse them or they would send somebody in there to gather intelligence. Volunteers, they go into a dark tunnel with a flash, yeah, or there might be hidden exits, but you don't know. A flashlight, flash, flashlight and a pistol. So for the search and destroy, like when they were looking for an ambush, they knew they would be killed. Or a good chance, right? So it's like a suicide, like maybe not suicide, but you know, like how's that different from like suicide bomb? Well, the suicide bomb would mean they know they're going to get killed. These guys, they know they can fight back in the ambush, and they know their support. Okay. But still, it's incredibly hard on. Them. And about one out of every fourteen soldiers in Vietnam were actually in combat. The rest were support troops. And so think about that for a second. That means those men in combat never left. That means they never had a chance to calm down. So they're still calling the battle fatigue. That's part of the reason why battle fatigue was actually even higher in Vietnam than, let's say, World War One or World War Two, because the the uh, ambush could happen anywhere. The after the war, you would get PTSD. That the term would come out. We're dealing with veterans after the war. Because battle fatigue, what does that even mean? They didn't want to say what it really was. They called it shell shot in World War One. The reason they win is because we had helicopters. That's what we thought. But the reason we thought we could win. We use helicopters, we could move men and troops so much faster. The French didn't have them, so we might not have enough men, but with the mobility of helicopters, we could win. Now, it did dramatically surprise the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese how effective helicopters were. And they had to adapt different tactics, and they would lose some battles. But still, helicopters had the same problems. You can land, take an area, but soon you're going to fly away, and here they come back. And they're really easy to shoot now. And that's part of the reason. What, and so they're going to fly really low so they can surprise them. So you know anything about helicopters, they fly really low. The problem with that is you're flying really low in your head. You have no time. Yeah. You can't escape. Another good friend of mine who was a helicopter crew chief in Vietnam, he can't talk to special topics this year. But uh, his, he was in five helicopter crashes. One, wow. He made it. They were quite the same. Even this. And a couple things. So the US will use, if we have not enough troops, intense firepower. 
artillery, and bombs. Firepower will make up the difference for not having enough men. And napalm would too. Jungle hideout, fire. So this is the jelly gasoline they use in firebombing. So that's that's a napalm canister dropped on F-100. That's, see the fire? That's a napalm attack. And also, they set up, they basically divide it up into a grid, and they set up areas in South Vietnam they call free fire zone. They just said, okay, everybody in that grid, if you're still there after a certain time, you're VC, and they would bomb them. Unbelievable bomb. These are V-52s that would come, they'd be at 40,000 feet, and they would drop, they'd be modified to carry 70,000 pounds of bombs. So that's a string of bombs that go on for a mile. And the thing is, a 750-pound bomb can't tell the difference between a North Vietnamese soldier or a Viet Cong or a three-year-old child. Can't tell the difference. The shockwave doesn't know who's a civilian and who's a soldier. That's why well over four million South Vietnamese would die. Civilians would die in this war. That the war would have ended in 63 because they would have been unified. Those are scary. That is the results of a napalm attack. Some of you probably see this picture. It's one of the most famous pictures of the war. It was actually done at South Vietnamese Village. It was actually done by South Vietnamese Air Force, being directed by an American forward air control. Because you know they flew together with American equipment. But her clothes have been burnt off by napalm. She is horrifically burnt. There are color pictures of that too. I don't like it. It's awful. You can't see how it's just covered with third degree burns. She survived. She's still alive today. But obviously not quite the same. And that's a classic example how in this type of war, you don't know who the enemy is. In fact, it would be after this, they would adopt the term collateral damage as a way to try to avoid saying we just killed a bunch of civilians. And with the jungle, they also dropped millions of gallons of Agent Orange. Some of you probably heard of this, but that's an herbicide. And the herbicide, the idea was, okay, this will kill the trees. This is in the uh, Iron Triangle area. But that took millions of gallons. Well, a couple of things about this. They thought, okay, they can't hide anymore. It did not work at all. It didn't work. They couldn't drop enough concentration to kill all the forests. And so it was a total waste in that way. So it didn't work. But um, that's one of the rare areas, but that's still jungle here. And it dropped on civilians and soldiers on both sides. So Tens of thousands of Americans came back and started developing cancer, especially thyroid cancer. It's very carcinogenic. It turns out to be incredibly toxic. And for young children, but especially if it got found pregnant women, the birth effects were horrific. Absolutely horrific. And I've always kind of thought, well, should I show a picture of that? And I don't like it. They're just unbelievable how bad the birth defects are because of this. And the amazing thing was they used this stuff all over the U.S. Eight. It killed everything. So, the casualties begin to go up more and more. And yes, the U.S. could take ground, but it didn't look like victory. And these are wounded men. He's signaling a helicopter, but that's a very one of the more famous dramatic poses. Almost looks like, you know, that. But he's actually yelling at a helicopter above. That's the cover of life. Two horribly wounded Marines. Those are Marines at the Quezon Fire Sport Base that have been killed and they're just taking the bodies out. As the casualties go up and more young men have to be drafted and more and more young men aren't volunteering, that's anti war protests would begin. There was always a pretty vocal anti war protest. It started off pretty slow. But more and more, and a couple of things about it, it was from a real cross-section of society. There were people from all social economics and all ages involved. The Nixon administration by 1971 did an incredibly effective job of, job of painting anti-war protesters as being a bunch of drug-addled hippies and, and anti-American. And that's, that's not true. It really was a whole cross-section of it. And there were pretty intense counter protests that would get very violent, especially by 1970. But I thought this was a pretty telling one. 
And then this one just kind of makes me laugh and away from me. So this is to bring soldiers back home. But here is a counter protester with the every communist is a fake sign. I just thought that was like, how can you argue with every communist being a fake? Let's get it. Got a bit. I wonder, fake? Don't be a fake. A fake is like a jerk. So, one of the biggest anti war protests that actually shocked people inside in 1967, over 100,000 protesters started at the Washington Monument, walked across the river on a bridge, and then went to the Pentagon. And this was all kinds of people crop. And they protested for the Pentagon. McNamara made sure that all the guards, no bayonets, you notice, and no bullets. They could not even carry ammunition out there because he did not want any incident to happen because it could happen both ways. Sometimes, sometimes some of the guards or police get a little bit too aggressive, sometimes both ways, and they can get out of hand very fast. That's one of the more famous ones, putting flowers into the rifle butts. But it showed how strong this anti-war movement was by 1967. By 1967, Gallup poll had almost 40% of the population wanted out of this war. Now remember, this is in Johnson's war, and Johnson won a resounding victory in 64. And he is becoming unpopular. In fact, the chant of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Would echo in his year. It is years for years. I did not mean to rhyme that, but as they would chat outside the White House. No. They said they were, but no one trusted. But actually, in 67, it was still pretty. Oh, by, by 70, it was pretty bad. And some of the things that were going to happen to the uh, to civil rights protesters, we got people that would be. Uh, this is one of the more famous ones. So at the end of 66, Lyndon Johnson got gallbladder surgery. Back then, gallbladder surgery, you didn't scar that long. See the scar? And he could not resist showing reporters the bloody scar because he's Lyndon Johnson. But he also wanted to prove it wasn't a heart attack. He had a heart attack early once. So see, it's just gallbladder surgery. Today, this, this, it would be about that long. But if you're tough, you can afford it. <laughs> well, with Vietnam, think about that. One of the most clever cartoons of this era took that scar. Look at that nose. What? You see the scar? Yeah. In South Vietnam. He put the map as South Vietnam as a star, not just to the presidency, but the country. It was beginning to tear the country apart. And by 68, it would. We are still divided by those scars from Vietnam. And at the same time, the beginning of protests that would turn into something more, and they were literally called race riots, or sometimes they simply call them the long, hot summers. But all over Watts. You know where Watts is? It's a pretty poor area of Los Angeles. But Detroit, Newark, but almost in every major city, that had a significant population of African Americans. It started out as he protests against a number of things, many times police violence, especially like Newark. A couple of young black teenagers were shot by police just basically standing on a corner. And that triggered just this huge uprise in 67. But these happened all over, and this rage. And the thing was this hey, we got the Civil Rights Act, we got the Voting Rights Act, but our life hasn't changed. Expectations went up, but they weren't met. And things that were still going on. In the North, there was still segregation. De facto means it's not legal, but it's a combination of cultural practices by insurance companies. They would not sell to whites in some areas, so blacks would have no choice. Blacks and Hispanics would have no choice but to live in neighborhoods that would be pretty segregated. So you still have that problem. And the United States is still about as segregated now as it was then, in some areas more than that. And poverty. In places like Newark, the poverty rate was about 70% amongst African Americans. And remember Urban Blight, 
where people moved to the suburbs and left kind of. So it, it's like the world is not better combined with police violence. We trigger these protests. And a lot of times what would happen is the police officers, and there was a racial issue here, it's a lot more white, but also they live in the neighborhoods. So it was like they came into these neighborhoods that were like almost a different world. Right? They started calling them like war zones, and I think you can imagine the problems with that. But Lyndon Johnson at first was pretty sympathetic. This is what he said in 66, when he's trying to say, you know, they're just, they're wrong, we gotta stop them, but, but pretty soon Johnson would turn against them. And there's the beginning of a backlash. Johnson used to carry around a three by five car. He had all the laws of the Great Society. And he would say things like, look at all these laws we passed. Why are they protesting? And they try to explain why it's really hard and they're upset and, and things aren't, you know, they just can't take it without this change anymore. And they see everybody else doing so well because the 1960s was the best economic time in American history. The highest economic growth, the highest productivity growth, more people entered the middle class, more people going to college than ever before. I mean, this was an incredibly <clears throat> vibrant time. And then and think about looking from outside and then seeing all this and you're not, or a better way to look at it is, you think you would never get a chance, or your children would never get a chance to have this. That's a big deal. So it just exploded, which of course, then once it becomes a mob, it has no logic. The National Guard and the Army would be sent out. These are actually members of the uh, 82nd Airborne in Los Angeles. These are National Guardsmen in, in Detroit. And in Newark, the brutality got amazing. Not only did they call out a required curfew, but the police in Newark were given orders that snipers set up over a hundred with very explicit orders to shoot any black male. That's eleven year old boy was shot by a police sniper. Shoot any black male who was out. And they begin to just pick off people. Stop the riot. By the way, how did people react to this? You some people were there, they deserve it. We should do more of that. See how divided the country is getting really quick? I'm confused. How, how does that make it like? Who's going to wrestle? They would argue we have to put down the line. We have no choice. So I, I, I can't even I can't even wrap my mind around it. Like with all the like branches of government, like I don't know, like if there's some levels of government, like if something Okay, what happened was the Johnson Justice Department did bring them, and that's something we know about the order in sixty eight. But when a similar thing happened in sixty nine, the Nixon administration did not. So it's going to take the Justice Department to say that they violated their civil rights. Yes. Oh, I was here Thursday. I I got you. I got you. So you're gone all the way to the Thursday. Well, we did. Uh, we did a lot of the fifties and sixties. And I gave a practice test. Yeah, let me get this real quick. So I gave this one. Yes. Yeah, you don't even care about passing. It's just to be out. You know why the way revenge? That's a really good word. Here's another example. And then the image is now becoming your own theaters. And then, and then I have, I'm going to get practice tests on Thursday and Friday. This is the. <laughs> 
I don't want to make sure those are you need to know. And if I miss it with class, I can always answer when you're used to it. It's really kind of like, it's like, is there a guy in this house? Tell you what, I did just enough time on there for copies. Okay. And so let me. Oh, wait. These are there. It's all good. So the other ones I'm grading. So we got that. Just yes. bring back tomorrow, okay? Yep. All right, everybody. I'm good news followed by more good news. More good news. First, a little bit of good news. So we're going to look at war in Iraq, kind of finish up the war. And this is a really hard one, but that's why I really like what happened that front line so I can stop and talk about it, go through it as a good video. But also, no, finish it up. As soon as we finish that up, we are going to do one more little unit, and it's going to be just only a presentation. We have to research a rebel, a revolution, or something like that. And we'll just do a presentation, and so we'll do a couple days of review, and then uh, next week, probably on Tuesday, not review, I'm sorry, in the life of my Mary. And then a couple days of presentation. And then we start the history of rock and roll. And the history of rock and roll, I will do a little bit of the history of rock and roll. I'll go through the beginnings, I'll play some music, talk about a little bit of the historical consequence, all the stuff that was going on. And then you, depending on the time, I might do a couple like era, just a few little things, but then you'll plug in the gaps and you have to choose either a group or a genre of music that I approve. Not approve of, so it doesn't have to be moved, music I like. Yeah, but, and if, they, it's, if it's a group or a style of music, it has to, have to become popular before 1996. I made an arbitrary year, so I wanted something that has a long term or kind of a, a long effect, and also something a little bit for you. So not only because then it, I'm more comfortable with old stuff, but also, but to get the idea of the influence it has, I get some out of it. So uh, think of a group, and that's be somebody that has enough, a lot of influence. You can't just be because they had one popular song. I know all of you want to do the 1910 Fruit Cup Company. <laughs> red by green by green. Red, 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 red by green. Or how about Ohio Express? Yummy, yummy, yummy. Yeah. Yummy, yummy. Yummy, yummy. Oh, you don't have to go. Only wiggles, man. Oh, my God, wiggles. Only the greatest. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> no. But and do yummy, yummy, yummy. I got lost, and I feel like yes, that that kind of song. I mean, that is such a sophisticated song. That, and it, but if we have time, I didn't have time last year, but I want to also spend a day of pick, just a day of really bad songs. 
Yes. Wait, are we still gonna do an art day? <laughs> I don't know. What about question day? Oh, I don't know about question day. I like question day. What are you doing on Friday?